Thank you, David, for the uh, very generous introduction, very kind words. It's, um, uh, I, I hope you all appreciate that I'm following here my colleague, uh, Dr. Ceccarelli, who gave a, an inspiring talk only a few weeks ago. And one of the challenges with this kinds of talk, uh, this kinds of talk is that it's not supposed to be a research talk. I mean, my goal here, or the, the, the agenda for the day, is to say things that are um, true about what the path from graduate school to uh, a faculty position can be without actually d discouraging anybody who's <laughs> in graduate school now. So I've um, been selective about the stories I'm going to tell. And um, you're going to see some of my ego, both in how I'm telling the story and uh, specifically in the stories I've chosen. And you're going to learn a little bit about how my ego has affected some of my research through this journey. I've got three dark stories. Uh, like I sort of suggested, they all occurred in grad school. And so I've got three dark grad stories. I've got three stories um, that were just strange that I, I think you may see bits of your own research trajectory in and you may find interesting. And then I've got three stories about the, the folks who've inspired me uh, to keep going through this, uh, to keep going uh, along the pathway. And I want to end with a, a, a sense of what I want to do for the next few years, right? Because this is a continuing supposed to be a continuing journey. My, my uh, fantasy is that I'll have a good 25, 30 years or 20, 25 years uh, here at UW. Uh, and so there's lots still to do. Uh, but I want to tell you about some adventures from about the period of doing a master's degree, so early 90s, to uh, about now. And I'll start off with some of the darker stories. Um, and I went looking for images that would represent some of the adventures, the dark adventures that I've had. And I couldn't find any, so we'll just stick with the map. The first dark story um, is about some research adventures in Chiapas. Um, as you may know, I have a, a long interest in uh, understanding authoritarian rule and the ways in which political leaders can use media to manipulate publics. And one of my first projects was to do a study of uh, the Zapatista movement, right? For, um, for many people, the Zapatistas are uh, important because they're one of the first sort of post-Soviet collapse uprising. The dynamic was very different uh, for the Sendero Luminoso and the uh, Landless Workers' Peasant Party in Brazil. Some people think of the Zapatistas as a failed social movement, right? They essentially achieved none of public policy goals, but they projected their agenda into international politics in a way no other movement had. And so what made them interesting to me was both their use of media and their particular grievances, which were uh, largely environmental. They were about land rights. And so my assignment for the period of field work in Chiapas was to go do as many interviews as I could. Um, come back and write a report about the causes of the Zapatista uprising. I'm going to use this prop. And um, many of the interviews went well. Uh, my Spanish is not great. I had a translator host. Um, uh, we flew into Tuxtla um, and uh, did a series of interviews there. A much more attractive city, San Cristobal, a series of interviews there. And on the very last day, we realized that we had picked up a tail that we were being followed. And um, as those of you who know the region may know that the um, judges in Mexico, particularly, have their own police force. They're called the judiciales, and they're notor notoriously corrupt. We had picked up our tail, and we were pretty sure that they were working for the, the local judges. And the last interview I had was to try to spend some time with Subcomandante Marcos, to try to get an interview. We were in the car on the way out, and the tail for the first few uh, days of our trip there hadn't bothered us at all. Um, there was a driver, there was my colleague I was doing the interviews with, and uh, the guys, the Cudiciales were in the back, back of the, um, behind us, driving along the Pan American Highway. And uh, as we were getting close to our interview date, um, the location, the truck behind us uh, sped up and started shooting uh, machine guns at the car. The Something ricocheted off within the car, hit me on the head. I lost consciousness and fell into the, the well of the back seat. And it could have been 30 seconds later, it could have been 10 minutes later, I don't know. Uh, woke up and we had spun off the highway. Everyone was OK. Uh, there were no um, bullet holes in the car. I've been told it's hard to 
shoot at a moving target from a moving target. Um, but this moment uh, scared us. It still scares us. And uh, I'm shaking a little bit because I haven't told the story. And it's, uh, at the same time, it's, it's one of the toughest stories I'll ever tell. And, and uh, this was set up the, the longest night of my life. Um, but in other ways, it's also the best night of my life. So let me explain a little bit. One of the best nights of my life. We leave the scene. We go back to the hotel. We have to come up with a strategy. We're leaving in 24 hours, and we don't want any more trouble with the courtesy eyes. So we check in. We go to our room. Uh, we tie bed sheets around a pole and crawl out the window to the, floor, to the ground outside and go find another hotel. Uh, we check into the Best Western, right, which is the only armed hotel, uh, right, in Chiapas um, with guards. We check in. Um, my colleague I'm traveling with is female, and so she faces a different set of uh, risks from what I face. Uh, the hotel management puts us up in a wing on our own. Uh, there's nobody else in the hotel. We try to make some calls, some international calls, and the phone lines are down. Uh, so we're getting more and more nervous. And I have a pen knife. I still have it in my office. I was going to going to bring it, but decided to leave it. Uh, it's a memento, but something I don't bring out. I pulled out my Swiss Army knife, and I, I put it by the door. I don't know what I was going to do with the Swiss Army <laughs> knife, but I, I put it by the door. You know those massive rubber tree plants that are in every Best Western? We, in the hallway, we rolled them into our room and blockaded the door and uh, figured out that we probably uh, needed to take our chances going out onto the street to make a phone call. I had a um, buddy in Toronto, in Canada, who was supposed to be watching out for me. I, we, we figured out how to get out to the phone booth, made the call, and he didn't pick up. He was watching a hockey game, and there was no, <laughs> he was too busy to pick up. Uh, so I left a panic message, but went back into the room uh, and uh, watched MTV all night long, took cold showers to stay awake. Um, I remember peeking out the window around 3 AM and seeing a guy was like a classic um, uh, film noir scene, a guy under the lamppost like this, right, with a trench coat, looking up, smoking his cigarette. And nothing else happened. But that was a night of terror for me. And uh, for some reason, it didn't stop me from doing more things like this. We were fine. We made it to the airport, no problem. We got on the plane, told the story, um, did the research. Um, and I think if there's uh, a storyline here, and uh, not to be too glib, it's that some people really don't want you to do your research. Right? Exposing especially social inequality um, puts people at risk. It sometimes puts yourself at risk, but it's still an important project. Because part of what the, the goal of the research was was to explain how it is that political elites had manipulated a significant chunk of the population out of their land rights for 70, 75 plus years in Mexico. Hundreds of years, if you want to tell a deeper story. So the research project itself was important. We managed to, to tell our punchline. Uh, I haven't been back to Chiapas uh, since. And um, I'm glad that that story was over. Uh, I was very happy when that research ended. That tale of different, of personal, um, of uh, so being in a threaten, threatening situation um, has helped me make smarter decisions about the kind of field work I do in subsequent, um, subsequent iterations as a researcher. The other dark tale I want to tell um, involves Haiti. Um, after doing this investigation in uh, Chiapas, I think we built a convincing storyline about how local elites were manipulating people out of their land, and then how peasants had managed to use digital media in really creative ways to inspire movements around the world right, to, to eventually devalue the peso, eventually perhaps have a significant impact on how presidents are made in Mexico. I mean, we could tell a big story about the impact the Zapatistas might have had in, the, in, a, in a big picture kind of way. In Haiti, the assignment was different. Um, I needed some money, and so I accepted a contract from the Canadian government to go and do some program evaluation to figure out um, which parts of Haiti had the same issues um, peasants without uh, land rights, and the same problem of uh, local elites manipulating things in unfair ways. 
and I was, so there was a program here. I was supposed to pick the investments that the Canadian International Development Agency should do to try to improve the quality of life. And it was another um, difficult research journey. I remember staying in this um, okay hotel, businessmen's hotel, which usually means something that's not very nice, in Port-au-Prince. And every day I would get out and go to work and be met by a pimp with uh, his coterie of um, female sex workers. They, I guess they were used to having UN personnel uh, staying in this particular hotel, and so they maintained a guard outside. And every morning I had to say, Thank you, no thank you, thank you, no thank you, thank you, no thank you. And uh, after a few days, he got it into his head that it must be boys that I was interested in. <laughs> and so um, on the, one of the last nights there, I was having a dinner just inside the hotel. I'd finished the work, and um, this boy climbs up over the wall of the hotel. And I see him jump down, and he comes over, and we start chatting. I invite him for dinner. I had no idea what was going on uh, until, of course, uh, after dinner, he pops the question, and I said, no, thank you. Uh, but my heart sunk, because that journey through Haiti uh, involves seeing some of the most beautiful ancient uh, defenses ever built, right? The, there are a few walled cities in North America. The walls of Quebec City are a great set of walls. The citadel was built by um, the first independent black nation, right, in the early 1800s. This was a proud country that started off early on the path to independence. And now you walk through Cité au Soleil, right, the slums of Port-au-Prince. If you want to um, smell and hear and see and touch human misery, you go through the slums of Port-au-Prince. So this country um, has had a difficult trajectory through history. My report was to try to get some funding agencies to spend money in the right way. I identified some ways of um, uh, trying to plant lots of trees so that the coffee plantations, which sometimes made money, uh, could expand. Uh, who knows if they planted those trees because five years later there was another tsunami, uh, ten years later there were significant mudslides. The lesson for me from this field work was that even though I did my best to write a good 30-page report, sometimes your research changes nothing. Haiti is still one of the most miserable countries in the world. The third story, so I'm, uh, this is between masters and doctorate, and now I'm in a PhD program in Chicago and um, trying to hatch ideas for what to do. And this is where you'll see parts of how my, my ego interferes with my research design, right? Um, I wanted to study how poor families make decisions with limited amounts of money about how to spend money within the family. And I had spent time in Bolivia, I had spent time in um, Haiti. The other least developed country in the world is, um, is Bangladesh, right? Three of the world's great rivers, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, uh, the Meghna, all meet at one place and spill into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, this is a country built on silt. Um, but they are such wonderful people living in such poverty. My goal was to try to figure out ways of, of making life better for people on extremely limited income. And uh, I don't speak uh, Bengali, you know, and I'm a tall guy from Canada. And I assumed that I could get there, hire some people to teach me some, language, some of the local language, and do a few interviews. And I found, as anybody who's done a methods class uh, would realize, that uh, I could not speak to any Muslim women. Uh, it's not that I could speak to some. I couldn't speak to any. I tried uh, interviewing with somebody. I tried interviewing with a male head of household. That got strange, uh, you know, strange kinds of data. Um, none of them would spend time with me on face-to-face time on my own, even when I, when I got just enough to get people to relax in Bengali to do an interview in English. This was, a research, this was just exploratory research. This was an impossible project. There is no way that I could have studied what I wanted to study. While I was there, um, I uh, spent some time in Dhaka, I spent some time in Calcutta. And this is a part of India that um, you, you may know curls up over Bangladesh and touches, to ch touches China. It's a difficult part of the world for different reasons. Uh, people call it, uh, the Indian government has called it the tribal zone for a long time because it's uh, 
a lot of different tribes, a lot of different ideologies at play. And you need a special visa to get there uh, in Northeast India to do your work. While I was applying for my visa in the Canadian Embassy in um, Delhi, I looked up on the wall and saw a picture of a high school buddy uh, on a poster in the embassy um, waiting room. Uh, the poster said, have you seen my son? And it was a poster that uh, his mother had been putting up around India. And this high school buddy had gone missing. So having had a not great experience in Bangladesh, trying to uh, find a research site, and then trying to get to Northeast India to uh, explore some other possibilities, I found the distraction. I called his mom and tried to find out what was going on and changed the three month period from being about trying to find a research project to going around to the major cities, the youth hostels, putting up posters of my buddy who disappeared. She eventually hired an um, uh, Indian army general who s made the argument, tried to convince her that um, this, my friend, had gone on a uh, drug tour, essentially, from the backpacker lodges in Delhi. You can go on drug tours, basically. And uh, you get robbed, and sometimes your throat is slit, and they dump your body down a gorge um, up uh, outside, uh, up in the cool highlands above Delhi. So that's what we think happened to um, my friend. And uh, this may have sucked the life out of my research drive. Right? Um, I did what many, I guess, Westerners would do. I went to Goa to try to unpack things. It was the off season. I had had no research agenda. My, my research agenda didn't survive the trip. I was severely depressed from uh, having discovered what happened to my friend. A uh, girlfriend had dumped me, but that was irrelevant. Uh, that turns out to be not to be so uh, important <laughs> in the long run. And, but it was an unhappy time, right, of trying to land on a research project. Once I got back to Chicago, I had uh, a great sort of turnaround conversation with my supervisor. Well, I'll say a bit more about it in a sec. Charles Reagan is um, about as glib as I can be. And he said, I didn't tell him the stuff about my friend, um, but he said, Phil, uh, life is data. He told me not to worry about having blown three and a half, four thousand dollars of Northwestern University's travel grant program on a project that would never materialize. And, but because I would use this experience in some way, in some other way, later on in life. And so I still remain deeply grateful for that advice. Um, and I still have a box of photocopies of um, uh, arsenic locations in the Delta, the ba uh, Bangladeshi Delta. I will never do this research, but I'm not going to throw those photocopies out. Um, I ended up, at the time, landing on two other possibilities. Um, one was a possibility of studying um, political life in the States. Right? At the time, it was the late 90s, Gore and Bush were warming up for the 2000 battle. Uh, I was interested in the internet. Uh, why not try to put them together? The other possibility was to study small group interaction, a social psychology kind of study of uh, Antarctic research scientists, which would have involved a year over in Antarctica. And uh, you know, my heart was not in that. I, I, <laughs> in, intellectually, I could compose the argument for why this would yield great evidence, but uh, I didn't go. Um, I landed on this more interesting study that um, ended up bringing me face to face with other odd characters and um, giving me a taste of what American politics is like. And I never thought I would be interested in American politics. No offense. Uh, this is where I lived in grad school. And so I want to go from the three dark stories, right, the three lowest points probably uh, of my research career, to three strange stories. And let me start with this one. Um, this uh, friend of mine called it the Fight Club House. I was in D.C. Uh, I needed a place to live for the pre period of the presidential campaign. Uh, I'm a grad student, right? So I had $400 a month and 100 for food. Um, where do you think you live for $400 a month in D.C. Uh, during an election year? This, actually, this second floor is where you live. <laughs> That's where you live. Um, for $400 a month, uh, you get that second floor. For $200 a month, the uh, Van Halen roadies were living in the basement. 
this house um, was an amazing house. This house was built for the treasure of the Masons in the late 1800s. All, uh, many of the public rooms had these circle square things going on and trap doors and the woodwork. And there was a, in the dining room, there was a, uh, one of those hidden pedals where you could summon the servants to come out to the, you know, bring you, your, uh, bring you, your din bring your dinner. Um, that was uh, 150 years ago, right? Uh, around 1910, uh, some nuns took it over and turned it into a shelter for homeless men. And it was a shelter for uh, some 80 plus years until the health department closed it down. And they had uh, stripped all the door, taken all the doors out of all the rooms and built bunks for the homeless men. And uh, it had degraded to a point of not being uh, serviceable as a public housing and not being livable for anybody but grad students looking for a place to live. So a couple bought it. Um, this was going to be their fixer upper. Uh, this picture is actually from, 20, uh, from yesterday. I got this from uh, Google Earth, but it's the same. It's exactly as I remember it. Um, this was their fixer upper. Clearly, they're still fixing up. Um, there were uh, a significant number of rats. They had received a fine from the city for not cutting the grass. And as you know, in DC has a lot of rats, right? So to actually get a fine for having too many rats is unusual. The, they were not cutting the grass. The lawn had these kinetic sculptures that this guy had built with axes and things that would blow in the wind and grate. Um, there was no, the, w before I moved in, I insisted on a door. The, like I said, the nuns had taken all the doors and, and laid them end on end in one of the carriage houses. And the owners were having trouble, because there were 12 bedrooms and nine bathrooms, they were having trouble fitting the doors back to the original frame. But I insisted on a shower and a door. The shower they bought from an army surplus um, thing. So remember in MASH when Hawkeye and Pierce were talking to each other in the, in the uh, shower? That's the shower they built for us. Um, there were uh, rats that I remember rat once running over my sleeping bag at night. There were cockroaches in the kitchen and in the refrigerator. You might think cockroaches would not get in the refrigerator, but they can. Um, the, the Van Halen roadies in the basement had a pet snake. and. <laughs> So they liked to capture the rats and feed them to the pet snake, right, as you would. Um, and I was their first tenant. Um, the roadies moved in a, a month or so afterwards. There was, there was a, uh, a guy who lived up in the top, or was not supposed to live, but he was living in the top floor. Uh, we would try to seal off the windows as part of $400. I had to help with the repairs occasionally. Um, they sealed off the windows to try to keep him out, but he kept finding his way back in. Uh, once he even came to a house meeting, which was sort of amusing, <laughs> um, but he would rearrange the wood furniture and then to cre creep us all out, he would make this little sort of wicker dolls and hang them from the ceiling <laughs> and then disappear. And eventually we gave up on the prospect of sealing the third floor and we sealed ourselves in, right? We, we sealed the second story. So we just gave up on, we, we gave up on that third floor. Um, as you know, the election went into overtime that year, um, so I had to spend an extra month there. And one of the superb ironies of doing this, thinking of this as field work in the context of Chiapas and Haiti and Bangladesh, is that I, I was working for the Pew Internet and American Life Project, and I had to leave by dusk each night to get home in time to chop wood for the fireplace, because there was no heat in the house. Right, so one of the world's great metropolitan political centers, I was leaving before dusk because it was too difficult to chop wood to keep myself warm <laughs> overnight in the middle of Washington, D.C. The, the post office was suing because a post postman had fallen through the, um, <laughs> the porch here. And as you can see, it's, it's about, as, about as what it is. If there's going to be a lesson out of this story, um, it's a, involves something I haven't told you yet. The nice thing about this story is that I met Gina there. Um, I didn't actually ever invite her to the house. <laughs> uh, but th this was the beginning of this. If I was going to say anything about what I got out of this, um, uh, I got something wonderful out of this. From there, I managed to do a good project. And um, many of you uh, will know you get into a position of being as an assistant professor and associate professor, and your head is down for the most part. You're writing. You're not taking on too much new field work. You're working with the material you have. And eventually, once you get 
to be an advanced associate or a full, you are able to sit back and start something new, I think. Not everybody does it this way, but it's a common trajectory. My new thing eventually was to go back to studying the rest of the world. So uh, the cohort of professionals I was following around who worked for Gore and Bush, and between election years, between presidential years, they go off to other countries and ply their trade. And they were going to Russia and Azerbaijan and Tajikistan. Uh, they would sometimes go to other democracies, but not always. So I got interested in following them to these other countries that um, you'd think would not need political consultants that are interested in um, manipulation, uh, electoral manipulation, but they, you know, whatever, you go where the money follows and, uh, follows, and these folks were going overseas to help authoritarian elites be better at winning elections. I ended up doing a book about the um, digital media and political Islam. I chose the set of countries because I had some field work experience in uh, Tajikistan and Azerbaijan and Tanzania. And uh, for the first time ever, I think I was doing, I did a piece of research that had some impact, had some public impact. And a couple of years ago, uh, three years ago, I got a call from the Bush Center. The, uh, as you know, when a president retires, they go back to wherever they came from and try to build a library or a research center. And um, during the Arab Spring, George W. was interested in hosting an event about freedom and invited me to come down, give a talk, um, offered some money um, to help uh, pay for several grad students' worth of um, uh, tuition and uh, research stipends. We did a report, and I went down and had a good time, but not a great time. So uh, there was one uh, wonderful dinner um, with um, Condoleezza Rice and President Bush and his wife and uh, uh, two other folks. And I remember trying two jokes. And after I tried the two jokes, I didn't say much for the rest of the night. Uh, the first joke when I, met, um, when I met the president was to um, shake his hand and say, hi, I didn't vote for you, just to see what he would do. And he did. <laughs> He didn't do anything. He just looked at me, so I had to follow through, right? And so I said, well, I'm Canadian. I didn't vote for you. And he, 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 he just he took my hand, and he said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so that was my first attempt. And then we're eating dinner, and um, it's a small dining room table in his um, Texas home with a life-size portrait of his two daughters in yellow dresses, probably preteen stage, but also sort of vaguely horror movie-ish, you know, a painting of the daughters looking over the dining room table. And so we're eating our meal, and he's serving. And I say, well, as the second joke, I say, well, I, I, I married, a, ma married a lady from Kentucky. I think I'm supposed to like Kentucky barbecue. I can't like bar uh, Texas barbecue, barbecue. And he looks at me, and he says, well, I'll give you vegetables. <laughs> and so he gives me vegetables, and he goes around the table, and he does come back, to his credit. He does come back, and I get a small portion of meat. But, so the evening was wonderful in the sense that I get to meet some historically significant figures. Um, it was also awful in the sense that we did not talk about anything substantive. Now, you would think that uh, three, four hours of Condoleezza Rice played Chopin on the piano. That was neat. But um, we talked about the weather. Uh, we talked about the painting. Uh, we talked about nothing substantive. And so I don't know if that was deliberate or I'm an outsider. I didn't vote for him, obviously. Um, but that was a surprisingly empty evening, a strange interaction for me. The next day, this is the conference center at the Bush. Um, uh, this is the, the main auditorium at the Bush Center. I give my spiel. It's trying to shorten, punchy, and active voice, and the present tense. And um, the Bush gives his uh, portions of his second inaugural. And those of you who um, know your presidential record rhetoric may remember, this is the, one of the things that's famous about this, fabulous about this speech, is that it refers to all sorts of historical events that had nothing to do with his presidency. Right, so he gives the speech. And I look out over the audience. And I realize that um, the audience is almost all uh, women above 60, elderly Texans, uh, except for four lost boys. Sudanese boys in their early 20s. Bush finishes his stuff. I finish my spiel. It's time for questions. And um, the only people to ask questions are the four lost boys. And they stand up and they ask questions, of course, not of me, of President Bush. 
Um, and the questions are all basically the same. They're all um, with the cue card. Mr. President Bush, could you say something about what you were thinking when you allowed me to come in the country? Uh, softball questions that were clearly planted. And um, silly guy, I should have realized beforehand that this entire event was a fundraising event. There was no particular interest. I mean, there may have been some interest in freedom as a buzzword. Um, but this was an attempt to, to get $100,000 from each of the elderly women in, in the audience. The research at hand was not uh, relevant for anything. And if there's to be a lesson out of this for me, it's that sometimes really people don't care about your research. It, it's not anything to do with particularly you uh, or the topic at hand. Uh, sometimes it's just people aren't interested. The most recent story um, involves the dean, who's just about to slip out. Yeah. So <laughs> the timing, timing is good. Timing is very good. Um, so I finished the, work in, um, uh, finished the work on the Arab Spring uh, and the proliferation of social movements that use digital media in really creative ways to catch dictators off guard. And Russia becomes a really interesting case for me um, because uh, Putin is fabulous at using digital media as a tool of social control. And so for me, there's something of an interesting learning thing going on where some regimes are clearly learning from the mistakes of Mubarak and Ben Ali and uh, trying different things in the way they manipulate their publics. And so about a year after the Bush invitation, I get an invitation to go to Sholokhov University, which is this, um, the humanities university in Moscow. Um, and it's famous, you may know it, it's famous for producing, it has the best pro undergraduate program in uh, um, lie detector administration. In other words, if you want an undergraduate degree in how to administer a lie detector test, you want to go to Sholokhov University. I, I don't learn, I, I learn this once I get there. Um, this is Putin's favorite university because the higher economics university doesn't play ball with um, Putin. Uh, so this university is getting a significant amount of public resources. I go and uh, they want to propose the uh, Internet and Russian Life Project and would like to have me help direct it. And um, as part of this, they want to send me $70,000. And, and, $70, and uh, I say, yes, but I want to run it through the university just on principle. I'd like to run funds. It's good for funds to run through the university. I say, yeah, but I want to run it through the university. And they say, oh, no, 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 no. We can't. One university can't uh, give money to another university. It's an anti-corruption thing, they, a rule, they say. <laughs> and, so, and so they say, well, uh, so we can't wire the money to you. Why don't we send you cash? <laughs> and I say, well, OK, OK, but we've got to work with the college to try to make it happen. And uh, so they, their proposal is to send, and I say, I can't receive the money. It can't come in my name. It has to come to the University of Washington. They say, well, okay, we'll, we'll send the money. We'll send it to your dean. Um, and by the way, there's a rule. You can't, you can't send more than $10,000 at a time in, physically in a FedEx package. Uh, so their proposal was to send Judy Howard seven FedEx packages <laughs> of um, $100 bills, you know, with $10,000 bills. And so, you know, I, I actually just... I can't decide whether I should even float this as a possibility you know, <laughs> with Judy. Uh, but I, I decide to start it off. I start the email, well, you know, you have to get things going. And so I send several people, you know, is it possible to take cash? And I think it's very important to set um, admin chairs and deans up for success, right? One of the bits of parenting <laughs> advice you get very early on is you set your kid up. You try not to set up a structure that will enable, make failure a possibility. You want to set up success. So for chairs and deans, I agree, you want to set up the opportunity for success. And I did not want to create a situation where Judy got seven packages with $10,000 in $100 bills. And what I learned through this uh, email correspondence with various uh, UW officers is that um, the university loves donations, financial support for research, but doesn't take cash. <laughs> there, there is no administrative process for receiving cash um, for the college. And so I had to say, thank you, but no thank you. Um, it didn't stop the group at Sholokhov University. They launched the project anyway. They took the write-up proposal I had done and did it themselves. Right. So 
if there's a takeaway from this weird story, I would say it's that um, people will copy your ideas, right? They'll take your ideas, um, but you'll get something out of it. So I got a fun excursion to a neo-Nazi summer camp uh, where Putin spoke, um, which became field work, right? <laughs> became um, data, because life is data. So I don't expect to go back. Um, I don't expect the FedEx packages will ever show up. Um, but let me review, I think, by, just by way of closing, a uh, summary, winding down some of the lessons here. So for my dark stories, I think there's three perhaps good statements I could make. Some people really don't want you to do your research. Um, from here, the takeaway is do it anyway. Sometimes your research changes nothing. Do it anyway. You are your best research tool and your biggest source of bias. And this was my experience in Bangladesh. I guess the lesson there isn't doing anyway. I do it anyway. The lesson is do something else if you discover. <laughs> For my odd stories, sacrifices pay off. Uh, right, uh, grad school is a wonderful, organized way of getting very smart people to live like rats for an extended period. Right. <laughs> Um, but I found a wonderful life partner out of it. So you get things pay off in ways you can't always expect. People may not be interested in your work, but they may be interesting people on their own. I got to play Chopin with Condoleezza Rice, and that was fun. People may also take your ideas, um, but you'll still get taken interesting places. You can't always tell whether your research is going to, where it's going to pan out, or whether it's going to uh, yield something productive. But if you have a sense of adventure, I think you have an adventure while you're doing the research. Let me say something quick about the three characters who I think um, have inspired me along the way. Uh, some of you will know these folks. Uh, the first is Charles Reagan, who's my supervisor. Um, he was fabulous because he was not interested in science and technology studies at all. He just wanted to support me. Uh, he had no particular familiarity with um, usability studies or information technologies. He just wanted to support me. And he would always say things like, life is data. Everything is good. You know, everything is a fuzzy logic problem. It's, <laughs> it's everything, everything was OK. The guy in the middle is Charlie Moskos, uh, famous for don't ask, don't tell as a policy, but also um, contributed in many other interesting ways to public conversations in the US. Um, he crafted the first editorials arguing for an AmeriCorps-like organization. He's famous for a study arguing that um, the Army is the most egalitarian organization um, around because it's one of the few places where you get promoted entirely on the basis of merit. Every other institution, non-military institutions, can't claim that. And from him, I got a fairly simple um, uh, bit of inspiration. Um, I remember uh, he was Greek, and which means going out with him was always meant eating Greek food. And I would try to pay once in a while, and he would always say, Phil, if you ever become a professor, you have to pay for your grad students. And I, I hope, for those of you who are in the, I think I've been good about following through. Uh, he's passed away, but I, I try to make sure that if I'm at a table and there are any graduate students, they don't pay for anything. That's what Charlie told me. The last guy, I think, um, uh, Christian Davenport, I uh, met at Stanford at the Center for Advanced Study. And I think we tend to think of mentors as people who are older than us or ahead in the pipeline or a senior in some way. Um, he became inspiring because he uh, asks for whatever he wants. He just taught me to ask. Um, I wouldn't say I want his career. He's gone to a different university every two years, uh, driving up his salary. Right? We know what those scholars are. We know in our own domains. We all know folks who are able to do that. Um, so I wouldn't replace his, I wouldn't want his career, but he's been at stellar institutions. He writes 10 grants a year, and his adage from, his piece of advice to me was that if you write for 10, write 10 proposals, you'll get one of them. And that's what I've taken away from my relationship with him. I, I write 10 proposals, and nine of them don't work. I do a lot of recycling, but one of them works. And that's what can, can keep an agenda, a research agenda, going far. So life is data. It's all interesting. You won't all use it right away, but you may use it at some point. Make coffee and lunch dates um, and ask for things. I think these, maybe these 
these may be useful to wherever you are in the professional, um, in the pipeline. Um, because not being able to ask for things is an important skill. Being able to say no to something is an important skill. And I think those are the, if I would get it down to an adage, those are the things I would say I got from my supervisors. Let me land on two, let me land with two thoughts. And the first is to talk a little bit about what I want to do next. As many of you know, um, I'm developing this relationship with Central European University and the um, Open Society Fund. And I think one of the things that uh, we've lost uh, as a profession is the norm that once you become a full professor, and especially in the social sciences, part of your service work involves spending a year, your research leave, overseas, teaching at an institution with students who would not normally have access to you. And I, when we think about the great Nobel Prize winning economists and the political scientists, the sociologists who've written stuff, the communication scholars who've written stuff that now we have all inherited, many of them spent a year in Nigeria, spent a year in South Africa, spending their time collecting a pittance of a salary, but doing that as service. Hungary is at a fascinating point in its history where the regime is becoming more and more conservative. They're nasty to their Roma. They're nasty to their queer communities. And I think what's going on now in Hungary is going to be a, is a microcosm, essentially a small storyline for what's happening in other parts of Eastern Europe. It's a great example, unfortunately, of how authoritarian regimes uh, develop new techniques for public manipulation. And I see this opportunity to spend time in Budapest developing the local university as a really interesting service project. The students who go to this university, this is far from the ivory tower. The students who go to this university are students who will have a public policy impact in their region. And that's another reason why I want to go and um, shape, I think, help shape um, a generation of, of younger policymakers. The second thing I'm going to try um, in the next couple of months is to write a public book. Now, public uh, means uh, no statistical models, uh, maybe some long quotes. Uh, some citations, but not in text for uh, Chicago style uh, right there. I have to cite Wired magazine uh, for my, um, my book. Uh, I can't have any pictures, maybe a map, uh, but no tables and no pie charts. Again, it's got to be active voice. Uh, short sentences, a few sentences per paragraph is a very different writing style. And what I want to argue is that even though it seems like the world is more chaotic with Anonymous doing its business and Chinese hackers um, digging into American intellectual property, cyber war breaking out, the NSA spying on everyone. What I'm going to argue in this manuscript right now, it's called the Pax Technica, is that we're entering a surprising period of stability. And it's a stability that's going to come from, for better or worse, having Silicon Valley collaborate with the State Department on foreign policy priorities. There's some really interesting ways, this physical exchange is personnel, there's this interesting coherence between what Google wants out of information, you know, it should be free, and what the State Department wants, uh, the world should be free. And this is setting up a peculiar mechanism by which um, most of the political interaction is going to be digitally mediated, and the rivals to the stability, the threats to the stability will come from rival networks, what the Chinese are building. The Chinese are developing their own strategy. They've built a fabulous firewall for themselves, and they're exporting this right to Zimbabwe. They're exporting it to Tanzania. If you want to buy information technology and set up a digital switch, you can now choose between participating in what Silicon Valley designs for you or what the Chinese built for you. So the argument about this book is that there's going to be, basically, there have been, I think, three ways of controlling publics, money, you buy off opposition, small reforms, you make small incremental changes in policy, and media, you manipulate the media. Media has become far more important than any of the other two techniques for controlling population. And so I feel like I've studied different parts of the world over a long period of time, um, but I also feel like I've been studying the same process. Thank you all for listening. I hope you'll join me for the reception afterwards, and I'm happy to take questions, too. <laughs>